to another episode of the Social Work Lands Podcast. I'm your host, Bass Moreno. My guest this week is Mr. Hans Berrier um, out, of New, out of New York, New York State. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what he's currently doing in social work, talk about his past, you know, life in 2020. I, I'd like to ask my guests what was life, life like of all 2020 in the height of the pandemic and things of, of, of that nature, future goals going into 2022, since we in the official fourth quarter of, 20, of 2021 as of this recording. So Hans, thank you so much for coming on. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, go ahead, let everybody introduce, introduce yourself, let everybody know who you are, what you do in our wonderful field of social work. Uh, thank you, Bass. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, you know, never done anything like this before, so it's, it's cool to connect. Uh, I'm, I'm Hans Bernier, a licensed clinical social worker uh, out of New York, and um, most of my, all of my experience has been with, uh, in schools with kids and families in different capacities. So, um, you know, even starting before the social work stuff, um, you know, in high school doing, uh, you know, summer camp stuff at my, at my church, um, you know, being a camp, like a junior counselor there, and then, you know, doing after school work for a while with Good Shepherd in the Bronx, um, in the Fordham area, um, GED programming in the Bronx area, and, in in, uh, you know, Third Ave area. Uh, so this is all before I um, decided to go to social work school and um, about, I guess it was 2010, started working with an organization out of New York, out of Boston called Wadiko Children's Services. Um, they're kind of how I got started in this work back when I was an undergrad. And they're, they're Boston based, uh, which is where I did my undergrad. So that's how I connected uh, to them initially. Um, and they wanted to start a New York program. So, um, and part of that, they asked that I go back to school um, to get my social work degree. Uh, given that a lot of the work was going to be counseling based in schools, um, you know, as far as like contracts go, like needing clinicians uh, to be a part of the work. Um, so I, I graduated in 2015 from Hunter, um, you know, proud CUNY grad and, you know, been, you know, continued in the field ever since and, you know, uh, did a school social work job uh, at, a, at a district in Westchester for about a year and a half and um, recently transitioned to Columbia University uh, in their field office, supporting internship placements that started in February. Oh, awesome. Congrats, congrats on, on that. Uh, lots to, to unpack there. First, uh, hit close to home, uh, working Good, Good Shepherd in, in the Bronx and the Fordham and uh, Third Ave. You know, was, I, I can literally tell you all around Third Ave. Uh, <laughs> No, going going to high school uh, near, near Lincoln Hospital. Uh, okay. So, that, okay. so I was born in Lincoln. Went went to uh, Alfred E. Smith High School in the Bronx. Shout out to the Warriors. Um, my mom, God rest her soul, went to Hostos Community College. So I uh, and then I even worked in an after school program, um, like on East 149th by, by Sixth Street. So up and down 149th all the way from East 149 by the 6th train all the way through going into Harlem. I like, literally walked all, all that way. <laughs> so I, I know that area nice. really well. And Fordham, I've had two social work jobs in, in the Fordham Road area. So that, that's how I even started in the field, uh, working in, in Fordham. So it's uh, definitely hits, hits home. Nice. Um, we must have crossed paths at some point. I'm I'm sure we crossed paths <laughs> somehow, some some way. Um, now, um, 
work you know, you're working in in the schools like like you know working in the Bronx and all these different programs you were doing like what what was that that like for you like what uh supports or lack of lack of supports you, you know you had to deal with you know even for myself um I could think back when I was you know in seventh grade and now as an adult like I'm just turned 42 and like damn like I went through some systemic racism even with like my own like people with uh you know district nine at, you know, at the times it was like real district based in terms of schools and mm-hmm. you know, in New York City uh, they still got districts now but it wasn't like how back then when I was in school and like it's kind of like the district superintendent kind of like stole money and like all this other stuff and like we like literally chased down the at the time the New York City um, school chancellor in the neighborhood on like 168th and 3rd Ave like chased them like up and down like 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 Bolton Street up up, up in that area so like things things like that like how, like like tell me like a little bit about like what what you saw in the work and supports or lack of supports in the Bronx um so yeah all of that right <laughs> like and you know one of the reasons that I think I ended up in this space in the first place was um, I had a very different like middle school, uh, elementary and middle school experience that I did high school. Um, you know, I grew up in Queens uh, and then we moved to Long Island for high school. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like I was used to playing, like we didn't even have basketball hoops, you know, like in our in our yard, right? So we playing handball and like throwing, you know, throwing a tennis ball off a wall and there's a hundred kids, 50 kids, mm-hmm. you know, all of us trying to like, you know, make do whatever. I'm not acting like, my my story is well you know it's all hardship but like just the 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 the, the gap in yeah. resources between the, the schools that I went to when I lived in New York City and then I go to this high school they had the they have their own football field you know they have you know four courts outside two courts inside tennis court track you know what I mean and you know not saying that the high schools don't have that but like you know you look at the elementary schools there's playgrounds and basketball courts and full, you know, full football fields for kids to play. And that, that, that difference just always stuck with me. Like the, I remember my first day getting into that building in high school and just being like, like, what is like, how, like, how, you know, like I'm yeah. half hour away from my old house, you know, like this just feels crazy. And that disparity is always, dri- you know, driven, driven me and spe- specifically around schoolwork and like the power that school and education can, can play. Um, when we're talking about social work values, I think school, you know, kind of h- highlights all of them, inequity, um, you know, uh, access, uh, you know, school to prison pipeline, all of those things, right? Like, right. and uh, so just kind of always wanted to be in that space. And right after undergrad, uh, I was looking for work, couldn't find a gig, uh, you know, I majored in child development. I moved back to New York. I went to undergrad at Tufts University, which is like 10 minutes outside of Boston. And I was a New York kid. I was like, I got to come back home. I can't live in Boston anymore. No disrespect <laughs> to Boston. But uh, as a New Yorker, just, you know, whatever family's here and all that, uh, felt the need to return and just couldn't find a job. I was out of unemployed for like six months um, and then eventually landed this gig at uh, FEGS uh, wow. back in. So, right, they had a GED program right there on Bruckner back in, like, that was when it, you know, this was 04, 05, okay. originally right on Bruckner Avenue, right by the McDonald's there and the, um, you know, the, the, the Third Ave Bridge, uh, eventually moved to the hub, uh, 149th and 3rd. And, you know, I think the work there, the case management work really helped me understand, you know, like, potential and disparity, right? Like none of this, none of the, so I worked at a GD program ages 16 to 24. And, you know, like these are all kids, like, you know, I was 23, right? When I started the job, I was 20, I was, I could have been a participant in the program when I started the game, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, and- I was 21, like, 22 when I first started. You know what I mean, right? Like I could have been a participant in the program and, you know, the folks that I connected with were like the kids that I grew up with. And, um, you know, like just understanding that community is what the work is about. Connection is what the work is about. And genuineness is what the work is about. And, uh, you know, being able to just listen to stories and understand how people 
walk through the world, right? And a, a lot of times folks just need somebody to listen. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not about like, uh, it's about, you know, being, being there for folks when they need it, right? And so I was doing that work for a while and, you know, I think it's not uncommon for folks to change jobs every two, three years in that space because the work is so hard. Yeah. You know, like one of my, I remember a client of mine was murdered, you know, like he was, a, you know, a kid in the street, he was from Maryland and, uh, you know, went back home, was going to come, you know, was going to, was going to come back and start and start at, the, at BCC. He had gotten an internship, had gotten a gig, his girl was pregnant, like he had really, really turned his life around. Um, and it was on his, when he went back home to visit his, his family in Maryland, um, you know, was tragically, uh, was tragically killed. And I think after that, I couldn't work at that space anymore. It just like, I had to leave um, just cause I, you know, I still walk with that young man's story and um, was able to move into, in the, within the same neighborhood to the Grand Concourse in Fordham area at a after school program for middle school kids. Um, and then from there transitioned into uh, the school-based counseling work with Fidico Children's Services. So I was able to be in the same neighborhood for like 15 years, which was really, really dope. Um, you know, like some of the folks that I work with at a GD program, like their kids went to the elementary school that I ended up working at. And then when I, I was, you know, I ended up doing some height work at a high school. And by the time I got to the high school, like that kid's, you know, like that's this kid's younger brother who used to like run around the program when they were, you know, mom would come through, yeah. you know, program to pick, to pick the kid up. That's the little brother running around. So like it was, that felt really special being able to be in a neighborhood and in a community for, for that uh, length of time and, and, and build relationships and get to know folks and, um, you know, really see growth over time. Um, but yeah, all of those things are true, right? Like in all those spaces, it's just lack of resources. And even, even with that, um, you know, still people still making things happen, right? I think there's this false claim that, you know, you know, uh, you know, this, this capitalistic understanding that you work for what you deserve and everybody works, everybody works, everybody, you know, obviously there are folks on, you know, opposite ends who whatever, whatever, but like, I never came across a family that didn't work. You know, everybody in the house is trying, is doing something, trying to, you know, trying to take care of themselves and, and make it in their day to day. And when, when the opportunities did present themselves, folks jumped on top of it, man. Like, it's just, it's just not, just not true. This narrative, uh, you know, of the world that we live in, you know, like people end up in the space because they didn't work hard enough. It's just not real. Like everyone is working hard and honoring that, you know, honoring the work ethic of, of the community. And, you know, in my work at Columbia, you know, trying to talk to folks, you know, there's, for folks who don't know these neighborhoods, who don't know the neighborhoods, who don't know New York City, there's a hesitancy. I don't want to go here. I don't want to work in the Bronx, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't want to work in Brooklyn. You know, I, just like you, these are beautiful spaces, man. These are beautiful spaces if you, if you take the time to connect. Um, and that's what social work is, right? Like our role, that's our work is going to where the need is and being able to support and uh, walk in solidarity with folks. Um, and so like doing all of that and now coming back into the New York City public school space and being able to reconnect with all those folks, right? Like I disconnected, I was between the work in the Bronx and the work that I'm doing now, um, worked at a middle school in Westchester as a school social worker, uh, which really helped me understand New York State regs, mandated counseling, IEPs, BIPs, FBAs, you know, all the, all the alphabet, you know, the alphabet words or whatever. The alphabet, yeah. the alphabet no, I'm, I'm not into that right now. <laughs> <laughs> right, in Delaware, it's a completely different state, so I'm sure they have their own, they have their own, uh, they have their own language. But being able to learn that process, you know, was really helpful, and I think all of it has got me, you know, I think I'm, I'm finding a way to pull all the strings together. I'm in this space, and I focus, the internships that I focus on are, are schools and uh, nonprofit work in schools. Uh, so I think being in the New York City nonprofit space for you know a decade 
um, you know, being able to see the school, the school space from that perspective. Um, it, it's, it, feels, it feels cool to reconnect to the New York City DOE space um, and kind of pull all, you know, and pull it all together. How, how was it like working in uh, Westchester as a school social worker? I, it, was, it was great. I was in New Rochelle. Um, and, you know, New Rochelle is a fascinating space, right? Like, uh, te- you know, folks, families that had $10 million, you know, $10 million houses and then some families, you know, living in public housing, right? And they, and they go to the same school. I, I think it's a, a beautiful space. I really enjoy my time there. And the only reason that I transitioned was because this other offer, I would have, you know, I would have been there. I thought, you know, when I got that gig, I thought I was going to be there forever. Um, and that was... I had like in the nonprofit work, you're kind of jumping around a lot, right? So like I'm I work for this agency, they have me in three schools in a week, which was dope to get that perspective to like meet that many principals and get an understanding of like how what school culture really means in the in the various spaces. And uh, so that was a really great experience. That was with you know the the agency work that I was doing. So I was in a bunch of different schools. Um, so this gave me the opportunity to do social work, like no admin work. I mean, obviously like the written work, but like no supervisory work, no like programming stuff, just like you're the school social worker for this building. I worked with a great colleague, uh, two, you know, at one point it was two full-time social workers. They then increased it to two and a half. And we really worked as a team in that space, but like being in one building, um, you know, year after year, I was able to be there for three school years. Um, you know, two of them, you know, trying to navigate COVID um, and, you know, being able to move with your cohort of students, right, going from sixth to eighth, like there was, uh, I think there's something really special about that work as well, mm-hmm. um, being able to progress with the kids and, and see there, and you, you, you understand progress in a different way when you're working with the kid, with one student for, and their family for that long, um, uh, so you know, I think, again, uh, finding all the different ways. And one thing I really love about social work is that you can do so many different things. Um, you know, like, I really love supervision work. So I, I currently, you know, in addition to the work I do with Columbia, I, um, uh, I support a, I do work with a group practice and facilitate group supervision. Um, I'm working with this agency called Black Men Heal, uh, which I, you know, hope to shout out in this work 100%. would love to talk about them more. It's a nonprofit agency uh, that provides eight weeks of free counseling to uh, Black men. That's the mission. Uh, they're always looking for clinicians who are looking to, to do private practice uh, work. So, um, you know, they pay a stipend to the clinician for the eight sessions um, and then provide the opportunity to take the person on as a client after. Uh, so in that space, I've worked with like five people Um and two of which have continued, and I, you know, still do individual work with that with those folks. Um, I do community-based uh, work uh, at a, at an outpatient clinic, um, and currently I'm still doing like um, still doing individual work, uh, just not through an agency anymore. Uh, so I do the work with Black Men Hill, and then I see I see folks for private pay, and I I, I love being able to do. A bunch of different things right like I can do this office gig um, during the day uh, and then you know if I'm working from home on a given day I could do some private private practice work I could do some some group supervision work right. um, and being able to have your hand in a bunch of different things I, I really I really enjoy that you bit, you're busy busy <laughs> always always gotta move always gotta move <laughs> But that, but that, but that's how that's how it is. Some, some you know, this field of social work, you can go one job and do another job, and it's like it's it, it, it's a lot. And then uh, I, I I don't know how how people do it. Like I, I was gonna do some some uh, virtual therapy, and I was like I can only do it on Saturday because this this job I started is kicking my ass. <laughs> like literally, I got. I got the, the, the kindergartners like really punching and kicking me. Nice. <laughs> so it was like, uh, I come home, I'm like, I'm tired. Like, <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. I got to drive half hour, 45 minutes. And like, 
coffee to wake up so I can drive home. <laughs> Now the you know the school based work is taxing you know because you can't do like you don't do anything during the day. You know you have all these you know um, IEP reports to write and counseling summaries to write and none of that stuff can get done during the day because kids are knocking on your door. Yeah, I mean for for me they 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 got me doing uh drive drive by like like drive by like the kids being dropped off so helping with that right uh, right then i got the lunch duty for for now they got me like from 10 30 to like one o'clock straight lunch duty like literally clean the tables once the kids finish eating lunch so like the kindergarten do half hour clean the table the first graders come in half hour clean the table so like just lunch duty alone and it's like and it's not a flex one. Like you starving and the kids are like, they got this banging food and it's like, they're not eating. It's like, it's like <laughs> in my head, like the Spanish comes out of my head. Like, phone you say, I'll eat that shit. Like, you're not eating that shit. I'm like, eat it. <laughs> right, 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 right. It's waste of food. Like, <laughs> but, but a lot of these kids you know they, you know, they cute loads. They, like you said, they just need somebody to talk to. It's just simple as a hug. Like, just definitely, you know, meet the kids like where, like where they at. Like literally. sometimes, it, of course, they are gonna try to play you. A lot of them <laughs> try to play you. Like I go bathroom, they just like you know BSing or so far or or whatever, not wanting to go to class. But you know, just even they don't want to go to class. I'm like, I give you a break. Just walk in the hallway for a couple of minutes, but you're gonna go to class. <laughs> so, so it's it is it, a lot. This is like my first experience. I've been inside an actual. Like, school building and do like school social work like like really like hands-on with the kids like even when I was working my last job like it wasn't like this intense um, and I try not to make it like too intense either with you know COVID you know going going rampant and getting getting emails like <laughs> like every other day so somebody got COVID like well, all right I'm not <laughs> I'm not dealing with the building so which leads to, uh, you know, you mentioned about COVID, um, basically like almost two school years. Like, how how was that for you working, like just not only professionally but like more personally like yourself? Like, how how you dealt with that? I mean, you know, we managed. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't, I think we're still dealing with it. Oh yeah, uh, we definitely still dealing with it. <laughs> crazy out here, man! It's crazy out here. Um, you know, I think the year that ended, so this was 1920, 1920, right? So that's the school year that we started, but then got cut short in March. And you know, that was not a lot of work got done. Just like not a lot of stuff happened, right? Like I had my kids here. Um, we were all in the house. Nobody could really go anywhere at that point. And there were tons and tons of kids who just didn't know school. You know, like you do, and what do you do, right? Like, how do you, how do you, how do you connect, right? Like they're not, they're not showing up, you call, can't really go to anybody's house right now. Right. And, you know, I think the knee jerk reaction is to blame families, but like, you know, a lot of the folks who aren't able to be home, they're considered essential workers. Right. So like it's not like people again are just throwing their hands up, but they gotta go to work, right? Like they don't there's exactly. no option, right? Now you're talking about, you know, undocumented families, right? Like folks who don't get paid above board or who get paid cat who 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 are working and getting paid in cash, right? You know, they gotta go to work. Off the books, right? Yeah, they gotta right. work. They gotta go to work. And these are restaurants, these are supermarkets, these mm -hmm. are you know, corner stores, right? Like these are the spots where or here you know, in Delaware people, we got farms working on working on the farm. Right. Whatever. Right. 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 And so, you know, like the most vulnerable again end up, you know, getting stuck. And I don't know, like if I was if I was 12 years old, 11 years old, and my mom is like, go to school. I'm gonna play video games, man. You know, like I, I can't even get mad at the kids sometimes, right? Like he's a kid. They're kids. Yeah. 
uh, obviously, you know, obviously there's a range where lots of folks were, um, some kids excelled, like some, I had some kids that actually excelled because of it. You know, some of, you know, some of the kids on the autism spectrum, like I saw that a couple of them actually, like they were like without the social, the constant social pressure, mm -hmm. like, and these were higher functioning kids on the spectrum. They were able, to, like they were on grade level academically, but had, you know, the autism diagnosis still. So the social stuff was there, were, were what their goals were around, their IEP goals were around. And like, I found that that population of student actually did, actually did academically did better. You know, obviously the social aspect, um, not being able to connect with kids, like that's, that's detrimental, right? Like depending right. on the age group. But academically they were able to do better, um, which I found, which I found interesting. Um, and then the following year, which was, nah, that had to be 18, 19, that initial year. The following year, 1920, this past school year, that started with COVID and then kind of slowly transitioned out of it. Um, or like, you know, at the end of the year, like doing hybrid schedules, half yeah. the kids in the building, half the kids out the building. That was an interesting experience too. Like, you know, seeing the, seeing the progression of like starting with only you know, the most restrictive classes, right? Starting with the eight to one to ones, they're able to come in every day. And then the progression to like the, the breakdown of the half schedule, that was interesting to see. And I found out with that sixth grade cohort that I worked with. So these were the kids that I had never met before and was trying to connect with them virtually. That was really, really hard to do. I did not have the same level of, of understanding of how uh, oh, how to support a student um, just because I wasn't in space with them. Like I never met them. I never heard, right. you know, it's just very different. Um, and same, you know, same boat, really like working hard to get kids to come, but all these, all these real life barriers, uh, you know, the, you know, I know that the virtual learning stuff isn't intuitive, right? Like you got to jump from this room to this room. You got to get out of this Zoom, yeah. this class, there's a Google Meet. The, you got to go into the Google, we're like we're asking 11 year olds to function like college students, man, you know, like virtual learning in that way, jumping from class to class, organizing yourself, you know, like not just like the building takes care of so much structure for kids. You yes. know what I mean? Like you don't need to, as a kid, you don't need to, me, you don't need to know the room number. You just, you, it's, it's muscle memory. You just walk to the room. Yeah, right? exactly. You know what I mean? Like that kind of stuff. Yeah, because when yeah, because when I do the parent teacher conferences and I ask my kids, like, what's your room number? They don't know. They just like go to go to the class. They just show you where the class is, but they don't know the room number. So I totally relate right. to that. Right. And they lose all that stuff with the virtual learning. Um, and have to now memorize another step. And all of those things are barriers, right? Mm -hmm. And it's it's really and it worked really well. I think given the realities, like I think there are lots of things that are never going to return, right? Like now every kid knows how to log into a Zoom, right? Like there are things that every kid knows now. Um, and again, I think there's, you know, there's a lack of um, socialization is a big issue. You know, I have some of, you know, I've, um, there are some older like college age kids that I, that I still connect with and they're freshmen in college. Last time they were in school with people was 10th grade. Wow. They're freshmen in college now. That's crazy. Like imagine, like think about that leap of being, like obviously there's, you know, the academic part, which is whatever. Um, not just whatever, but like school is so much more than academics. Like it's yeah, so absolutely. much more than academics. So like for a kid to not be in space around other kids and it's not, you know, now he's an adult. Like he's not a kid anymore, right? Like, mm -hmm. 10th grade to freshman in college. That's a crazy jump, man. And I don't think we give these kids enough credit for how hard that is to manage. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I kind of take a, a strengths perspective in, in terms of the whole Zoom thing. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, no, no, uh, no, they're learning like basically like life skills that they're going to need, like mm -hmm. job force skills, whether they realize it or not. I mean, we are, you basically, we're at a point now currently, like you don't necessarily got to go to college to, to make a halfway 
decent living if you are half if you're half like a techie like if you're like mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. you're into like the video games or anything involved in tech like there there's money to be to be made like without without a, a, a degree basically mm-hmm. um you know there's just so much so even like you know google and all these companies like oh you need a high school diploma now like, so um, you're making like 50 60 70 thousand depending what exactly what what you do what they're looking for so uh, so logging into a Zoom and then learning like the tricks to like, I even had like my daughter like like instead of her reading like they got she got like the audio playing and she's just looking at the words like it's just right things right. like that right. <laughs> it's like they figure things out like how to like to like get by and also that doesn't get talked about enough is we had a we had this past year and a half going on two years. A whole generation of latch, new generation latchkey kids that we got 10, 11, 12 year olds because of their parents having to work to survive, make ends meet, you know, especially a, a, a un, undocumented you know, parents who got to work, otherwise they don't get paid. Like, even you, know, you got 10, 11 year, old, year olds going or learning to be responsible or try, <laughs> like, you got to go to class on Zoom and then. Right. <laughs> Uh, they're home alone, uh, no fault of their own because the parents got to work, and parents are telling them you got to go on Zoom to do your classes. And obviously, the kids are not doing the Zoom, so it's like, what what do you do? And then um, for myself last year, getting referrals for like all these like absences, and like and I'm looking at the schools like, what are you doing? What have you been doing? Like, <laughs> I'm not working in the school at least like last year. It's like, okay, what have you been doing all this time? Like, now we're doing more truancy course, our truancy papers, so just of all this stuff. So it's, it, it, was a, it was a hot mess last year. It, it, even like before I moved, like the or the virtual first went down, uh, there was issues getting, uh, you know, laptops for kids and then getting like, like Wi-Fi, the little Wi-Fi looking things kind of look like this, a little bit mm-hmm. bigger than this. And like sometimes they work, sometimes they didn't. Sometimes the you hot spots. Get, yeah, the hot the hot spots. And then uh depending where you live, I even had a couple of instances last year that the person lived in a dead zone, so like nothing worked. <laughs> so it was like like barely my mom was like barely my cell phone works. So like so like the wi the, the hot spot didn't work. So it was like Kid couldn't log on to class, so, and then the mom refused to send the kid to school because we're facing. You know, we were still getting emails and all this stuff with COVID, so I couldn't blame the mom and dad. So, what exactly do you do? What do you do? What do you do? So that that definitely doesn't get you know talked about at all. I don't see nobody nobody talk, talk about that. Man. That's so real. That's so real, Bass. Like not, not even like the government, like no nobody. Like, that is like, so real. You know, we even got uh, a, a Latino education secretary. Like, bro, the homie's not talking about it. So it's like, like, come on, like what 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 are we doing? Nah, and just you know, again, it's are we the still same. having those? Are we still having those issues? Like a little bit of this year because we still. Depending where you live at, it's still over. Some people have still have a virtual option and still having the the same issues. People are still are still scared of, of trying to remain of not getting COVID. So, you know, we're not even going to touch on the vaccine right. or, 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 whatever, or whatever stuff. That's another that's two hours. I hear you on that. I hear you on that. <laughs> but it's just ah, but like everything's it's been again, it's politi- it's politicized and is is just been uh, absolutely insane no, and it's affecting our kids, today. man. The folks who can't afford the disconnect are the, are the ones who, unfortunately, you know, continually um, receive the resources last. And there's no, and it's just like, it, it, it didn't feel like there was any real problem solving around it either, right? Like, I don't, and I, to be, and I don't know what you do, right? So it's not even like point of finger, like, what do you do? Yeah, exactly. If you can't get the kid, you can't. You physically cannot bring the kid in the building. Grandpa lives in the crib. You know, mom is immunocompromised. All you know, there are all these realities, right? Like, mm-hmm. mom has to go to work. Grandpa, you know, multi generational living, right? Grandpa's in the house. Auntie's in the house. 
babies in the house, right? Folks are immunocompromised. You can't go, you can't be put that exposure because you could, you're going to harm your family, right? And then the, the Wi-Fi doesn't work, whatever it is, the computers, the, the computers busted. Even if all those things are happening, like how can you ask an, an eight-year-old, an 11-year-old, a nine-year-old, a five-year-old, you know, to self-motivate, to like sit on a computer and listen to a team? Like it just, what do you do? Um, it's super complicated. And it, but like the part that did feel frustrating was like, it didn't feel like, like, all right, so now we're in the third year of this and it feels like we're asking the same questions. Me, like, what? <laughs> like, uh, like, I don't, I don't know. And it's just, it feels, you know, again, like if maybe if, if it was a different population of folks, there would have been more problem solving. Um, but oh, yeah. it just feels like, the, you know, the same, you know, the, the folks who don't have the time to complain to the school board because they got to go to work. And some of the school, school to boards don't, don't give a shit. They focus on trying to get their money and figure things out and, and not talking real life stuff. I mean, even like my school district down, down here, my, my kids' school district, they talking a lot of stuff. And like, bro, like, you're not talking about day to day what parents want to know, what parents need to know. Y'all talk, talking a whole lot of bullshit for, for, two, for two hours. And it's like, and yeah, they got parents coming in, and like the parents were like bitching about the mask mandate that, that the governor did down here. And it's like, but you or like, do you understand that the governor down like in my head, I watched like the, the YouTube of the last two, two out of the last three school board meetings. Mm -hmm. The governor here in Delaware spent the whole summer with a bill on his table that he refused to sign to add more schools, social workers and school counselors in the building. Mm -hmm. He si finally signed the bill recently, maybe like toward the end of August. And then when I first started in the school building school year this year, the counselor, um, the school counselor that, that works in the school, she was like, you know, he only signed the bill for uh, elementary school. This is not for middle school. I'm like, mm -hmm. what? <laughs> like, what sense does that make? Like, everybody needs the the support. Like, yes, the elementary school kids. Yes, they they the ones who didn't have the socialization and basically put to you. But everybody didn't have the socialization. You got. I have, I was dealing with middle school kids that were, were contemplating killing them, killing themselves mm -hmm. because of, mm -hmm. of lack of, of mm -hmm. socialization. Like, what are you doing? Huge increases in anxiety, huge increases in anxiety. Certainly, certainly. And it's just, you know, it's clear that it's not a priority, right? Like we are, you know, we are a capitalistic, you know, capitalistic world country and how we deem value is by how much money we put into it, you know, just relative to what is spent on other things, like educating the most vulnerable is not a priority just never it just has never been um and you know you do your best in the space with the resources that you have and uh you know you 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 dig into the relationships you know like that 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 always felt like the work and um and that meant being trustworthy so when you see something that, that doesn't that like sy systematically is taking place, but doesn't, but like ethically doesn't feel right. Like, you know, you, you're my, um, my loyalty are to the kids, the families. Like that's my, that's the work, you know? Like, um, so like telling, like, I think you should consult an educational lawyer on this, right? Like tell a family sometimes, the kid's about to get suspended or whatever. Um, you know, I think it's important to, let families know of the option that they have available to them in, in situations like that. Um, because it makes a difference when there's somebody speaking at the language of the school, you know, during these, you know, during these issues. Uh, and, you know, you see it play out, you know, like, and you, you have a responsibility to do what is right. You know, I, I'm trying to find another way to say it, but like that's what yeah. we, you know, that's what we signed up for. 
Um, and sometimes they are in conflict, right? Like the job description and supporting and, you know, like supporting the kids and families. Sometimes those things are accountable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now I want to go into um, your role at, at, at Columbia. Uh, how, how are things in, in Columbia? You know, I, I you know, saw stuff on uh, Instagram about uh, some people of social workers being uh, treated un unfairly by the institution. I'm, you know, I, I don't know the whole details, so I'm not going to get into that. But like, your your role and what and what you've been doing, uh, uh, I have when you mentioned few work, I asked. You know, no, no, I went to Fordham and like <laughs> picking bastards. Like I, I had to like find like my my second field work placement. I had to look for it on my own because <laughs> they didn't help me help me at all. So yeah, you want my money, uh, and I'm still pissed off about it like 10, 12 years later. So, <laughs> um, so like how how's your work? What how are uh, the MSW students like, especially with the age of Trumpism and like everything that's been been happening that's really been like eye opening for like the last five or six years. People are like, we'll we'll show you face to face how racist they they really are. Like like there's no the boldness that that it currently exists in, in in our current society. Like 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 what do you see in terms of social work? in your role as the field placement and trying to find placements like you mentioned earlier. I'm not, I don't want to go to the Bronx. I don't want to go to Brooklyn, like, but the, the Bronx and Brooklyn has quickly become you know, really gentrified like real quick. So it's not, it's not, I seen like neighborhoods in Brooklyn that the houses are going for like a million dollars either, but like in the hood, like I, I work there. Like it's like, like drug lords run that. Run, run that. <laughs> So what, like, what you like, yeah. No, New York. The audio just went out. Oh no. Yeah, now I okay. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Uh, but yeah, my grandma was 110th in Manhattan. And like, you know, there was no buzzer, the door was always open, like, you know, always a wild dirty, they pick up the garbage. Like, I, like she passed away when I was like 20. And I was I wasn't in New York for a while and then uh, hadn't been in her neighborhood and like I walked past her it was, it was like it was like you know it was like the wizard of Oz. it was like which the west which of the east like the magic on you know, the audio, i'm sorry the audio is still going in and out anyway so vacation in new york is crazy how quickly that happened um but you know it's like, like the, the role that i'm currently doing you know, How about that? Yeah, I hear you. All right, there we go. Got to do old fashioned way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, the current role, you know, like you know, Columbia is an institution. Uh, so, there are realities that, that come with that, that, you know, I think I have navigated for a while as a Black man in this work. Um, but, you know, I understand um, the opportunity that you know, that they're potentially connected to the work and also don't look to the institution to do things that institutions aren't supposed to do, right? <laughs> um, you know, like, to, you know, like there are realities of how, even like the, how the buildings were built, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. uh, you know, these are, these are spaces that are, you know, pre-colonial America that, you know, are built by slaves. So like, there's a lot 
of weight in that understanding by itself and uh, trying to hold all that context at the same time, opposing things can be true. Um, but the work itself, I think is really interesting, being able to um, connect with lots of different agencies and schools and uh, other folks in the work. I'm trying to put together a school social work conference that's gonna happen in June um, and focusing on social work in education spaces where students are often trying to push out into. So things like hospitals and the prison system and group homes and uh, there's school happening in all of those spaces. And, uh, really innovative things happening in those spaces. So I'm hoping to uh, you know, find some best practices and, and, and connect with folks who are, who are doing that work. Um, but the field placement piece is really interesting. I, I, I do my best to be really available to people and uh, you know, like I've, I've, I've heard uh, others have the experience where the school didn't support. And um, I find that the folks that I work with, you know, all work really hard to, to, to support as many students as they can. And, um, but there's also the reality of like what social work school means for people now, right? Like um, not everybody walks into social work school to be a social worker, right? Like they walk in to be a clinician. They, uh, let me rephrase that. They walk in to be a therapist. Uh, I, I think clin clin I think the language of clinician can mean a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I think you know doing community work is clinical. Uh, you know what I mean? Doing uh, programming work is clinical, right? Like all of it doesn't clinical doesn't mean sitting on a you know sitting across from somebody with your, with your clipboard, right? Like that is a form of a clinical intervention, but that doesn't. I think the word clinical means much more than that. And. So, you know, oftentimes folks will say, I want a clinical supervision. I want a clinical placement. Uh, so as part of the onboarding work that I do with folks, I have a, I do like a, I hold three meetings a week for the students that I support. Um, you know, this was kind of over the summer, they've kind of tailed off now, most of the folks placed, but like at the height of the placement, I hold, you know, a weekly meeting and give an overview of what the placement prospect looks like. Here are a couple of options. Uh, here are the options that we have in the space. You know, pick three. I want to give folks, I think, agency in this, in the process as much as possible. I think that's a social work value in general. Um, so I see why. You know, I don't see that any different in this work. Um, and you know, I think I, I have. I ask a question like, what does define clinical? What does that mean? Because uh, I want to. I want to get understanding. Because I found like initially that folks kept saying, I want a clinical placement, um, and like what. Can, what does that word mean, right? And right. I think it's important to expand the lens. Um, and you know, I, I can't get mad at people, right? They want what they want. People want to be so, people want to be um, therapists, right? There's nothing wrong with that. We need therapists, right? There are not yeah. enough. Um, there are there aren't enough of them. They need trained therapists. Uh, but I do think that walking into the space with that perspective of I'm going to be a therapist only, I think a lot, I think things in the work get lost. I think I am a better therapist because of the community work that I did. I'm a better therapist because of the, of the family work that I did. Um, I'm a better therapist because of the programming work that I did. I'm a better therapist because I know I like, because of the school, because of being connected to a school system. Like, under, like when I work with the student, when I work with the kid, when I work with the family, like, I understand, like, it sounds like, oh, so you're saying that your son has year after year lag behind academically and your school hasn't evaluated him yet, right? Like, I wouldn't know that if I haven't worked in a school. Right. So, like, so I'm able to share, op like, if a family didn't know that they have the option of getting their kid evaluated, they would never get their kid. Like, obviously, yeah. you know, I'm not here shitting on schools. Like, there are lots of great obviously lots of great oh, work. Yeah, absolutely but you no know, like there are lots of reasons why a kid wouldn't get evaluated he might be jumping from school to school but you know what i mean like um and it's not like i'm not um accusing just providing that education like to, to the parents because you have that right that background like hey like have you thought about this and it just opens more 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 uh, dialogue and put, puts the parent like empower them to like hey like i even like think about this and just you know kind of the, the typical like in, in, engagement, like providing resources, you like, talking to them, like educated, providing psychoeducation, like all this stuff. So like have that 
and you provided that it's, it's like you said there's no knock or a school that's just like one example but that that's also uh, could be a fact like the schools are not, because maybe the sh- schools are, don't have the funding like to do that or, or, <laughs> or right. they, could, they could do the evaluation but they don't have like the, the pieces in place because they need staff as much as everybody else so a lot of different reasons Right. And like schools are actually being asked to classify less kids, right? Like there's, there is an understanding that there are, there is a such thing as too many special education referrals, right? There, and for good reason, right? If you're classifying every kid as as needing a special education intervention, you probably need to change some of your baseline practices. Um, Because if there are 40% of your kids need a special intervention, that's, you know, like after you hit a certain number, that's no longer the kid's fault, right? Like there's a, there's a, there's a systems issue here that we need to address. Uh, and I think the programming work that I did helped me understand that perspective. And that a hundred percent influences the way I interact with folks in the, in the like individual counseling space. Yeah, and it's great. So, so how do you, so uh, besides the MSW students and, like wanting what they wanted, they wanted to put, I want to be a therapist. <laughs> it's like, 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 what do you see? Like, they're like, from your perspective, like, how, how, how are they? Like, what, like, are they, or like, what's their like perception of, of social work though, or like doing the work or like, like any, like, oh, I don't want to go here. Like, and like maybe have like a misconception of like a neighborhood or, or things of that nature, like how, like what's the their reactions to stuff like that? Well, you know, like, this is a case, it's a case management job, right? I have like, you know, 150 some students that I work with to try to place in placements. And like anything else, like for various reasons, 10% of the people will take up 80% of your time. If you have a case load, like that is the math always. And, you know, and again, it's not because, uh folks are indignant or like nasty it's just like life happens right like there are certain folks who need more of your attention because the circumstances of their day-to-day dictate that um you know they're moving they had a family member pass you know the site instructor pulled out the last minute and can no longer do the internship so now you know they were all set up to do this one thing now you got to spend on you know you got to spend more time with this person um so like that part is just you know understood when you walk in um and as far as the um you know again i think part of that 10 percent of the folks who take up 80 percent of your time like there are folks who want what they want you know and it's this kind of catch 22 with social work right like our we teach we want to our, one of our mandates and one of our um, uh, one of our values is 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 advocacy, right? Like asking folks to advocate on behalf of others. And in this space, there are folks advocating on their own behalf for something that they believe in, right? And I'm not going to fault anybody for that. I'm not going to say that you can't have that perspective. Um, so I do my best to provide options to folks and be very candid and be very honest, right? Like, if you want this, then this will happen, right? So like, if you are holding out for a very specific placement, that could potentially delay the start date because there are only so many of them. Um, So you do your best to be upfront and give people as much information as you can. Um, And I think, again, that's a social work value, not specific to this role. Um, And let folks make informed decisions with the information that you can provide. Um, And I think that is something that I try to do in every any position that I'm in, any role that I'm in, is like, here are the resources and information that I'm connected to. Like, what do you want to do? Right? Like, my role is to connect the resources and support and next steps and like talk through on, un- un- you know, like uncertainties that you may have, but like, I'm not here to make decisions for anyone, right? Like, I think when you start at the work, you think your job is um, advice giving, right? And then as you progress, you realize that 
that's how that's how people that's how you get resent, resentments built against you in the world. Right. Um, so like here's your like I'm not gonna like obviously if it's a wild decision, I'll say that's a wild decision, but you know, if 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 it's a safety issue, that kind of stuff, but for the most part, like here's the information I have, here's my understanding of it. How can how can I help you come to a decision? Right. And, and uh, yeah, I, I just find it, I, I finally meet somebody that actually works at uh, you know, our grad school and wanted to interview somebody just to see just how, what the inter, interacting, inner workings of like, you no know, you know, field placement, how it is. And it's sounds like things haven't changed so much since I was in, in grad school and just to hear the, somebody working in the grad school from their perspective of like what they see so it's uh, fascinating and interesting to to get that perspective um you know, as of this recording we it's the beginning of, of october like what what do you, you got anything else going on like the rest of this year going into 2022 so i just i just want to mention black men heal one more time we have yes. a uh, instagram page um you know, black and brown clinicians, I think there's a unique um, role that we can play uh, in like, you know, the healing space, uh, which I think is a part of social justice. Uh, so I, I love the work that that happens uh, through them. So I'm gonna continue, you know, trying to, you know, speak to what they're doing um and recruit folks so if you know anybody if you're interested in participating as of that's that's just a, a new york city thing or just or it's more so it's uh the agency was started in philly by three black women um and they have expanded over the last five six years so um they the ed uh shout to uh tasnim suleiman suleiman um the ed was on the breakfast club like probably two three years ago with with charlemagne and uh that really helped uh bring exposure and resources to the work and i kind of fell into them i was connected to another it was actually over the pandemic i was participating in a zoom like a a, a zoom conference call for uh black and brown folks in the helping space it was called what's good bro i believe and it's like four clinicians four black male clinicians and they had an HBO show or whatever, um, and it's them talking mental health stuff. So I was a participant in that, and they mentioned Black Men Heal, and I kind of fell into that and started doing, I started connecting to Black Men Heal, doing clinical social work, doing clinical supervision um, for the unlicensed social workers that they work with, and holding a cohort of, of, of folks through the eight, through the separate, you know, eight week programming that they provide. Um, so I love that work. Uh, it's a healing space for me um, to be in supervision with other black and brown people uh, who are in the space, you know, not just New York, they're Philly, New York, Jersey, uh, DMV area. So Baltimore, Virginia area, and then Atlanta. Uh, so those are the spaces that they are providing counseling to black men in. Um, and the goal is for the agency to keep growing. And I'm just really happy to be you know, on the, you know, connect to it, um, you know, uh, through the New York work. Um, uh, hold it, hopefully, uh, gonna be for this, uh, ho hopefully this uh, school social work conference will be happening in June. That's the goal, so putting together a committee for that. Um, and then we'll see what happens. I, I, don't, I can't think further than that. That's a lot of, you know, and then, you know, we'll see what 22, 23 brings, but, um, that's where the energy and the brain space is going uh, uh, for the rest of the school year. Now, now this, the the school so, school social work conference that you're you're trying to plan is that just going to be a, a a New York City thing? No, no. So I'll certainly send it out. It's going to be a virtual, certainly, um, but the. Uh, the colleague who's in the role prior to me, Dr. Cindy Batista Thomas, a beautiful person, um, has her own, um, you know, consulting work that she does, and also she she works in higher ed at uh, John Jay. Um, 
she was like so helpful in the transition. Um, and she started this conference, what, eight years ago. Um, okay. They had to skip 1920 because of the pandemic, but held the virtual one last year. Uh, and I'm just trying to make sure that it keeps going because uh, I think it's a, a important conversation. Um, so the goal is to that, have, that's not that's not the one that that was I know I know there was a school social work conference I forgot where it was held up I, I know there's like more than one conference but I know there was there was one that was held I think it was virtual this year that they do every year so I don't know it might I don't know if it's the same one that you bring it might up. it might be the one that was held earlier was in March yeah I want to say it was in March yeah. Okay. So yeah, those those are the goals. Um, uh, you know, as, uh, as part of the as part of the role supporting the SIFI course too. Uh, so yeah, those are the goals. The SIFI course, um, continue working with Black Men Heal and this conference. Those are that's the those are the the uh, that's where the energy is going. Yeah, awesome. That and that and that's. And that's a lot. So kudos to you on top of everything else that, that you've been doing in, in the field. Um, I did want to touch briefly. Now, now you mentioned uh, the client that you had that passed away. Uh, I know for myself, when I worked in New York prior to uh, me moving down here uh, with COVID first hit and like, losing all these clients due to COVID, you know, definitely you know, really struck accord um, and then still kind of in a way like you know I'm always going to deal with that that's always going to be like you know the rest of my life the rest of my career actually having numerous you know clients like literally back to back to back like just passing away and then like I never made so many uh often condolences by phone mm -hmm. in my life like um so how, how did you Dealt, dealt with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was, I was straight out of undergrad. I was maybe two years out of undergrad, but when, you know, that tragedy occurred, um, uh, I, I don't, I think it took me a long time. Um, you know, I, I wasn't in a social work setting. You know, I was social services, which I, you know, I think is slightly different. Um, but it was tough. It still is, you know, like, and I, it, I, I think there are, uh, I think I took it really personally, you know, at the time. Um, and I wrote about it. Like I had to do, I'm not, a, I'm not big, uh, I'm not big on like journaling and recreational writing on my own is something that I would like to do more of, but if I'm like, I'm not, someone who writes a lot, like in my free time, I enjoy the practice. I think I would love to find a way to be more consistent with that. I don't, I don't do that regularly. Uh, but you know, I, in social work school, so this is, you know, probably five years after, you know, I worked with this young man, we had to do a, um, a, a you know, paper on termination. So I chose this, I chose this scenario. Um, and that felt like, that that felt healing um, and helped me understand kind of what how I was walking with it. Mm -hmm. um, but it was I didn't I don't think I did manage it for a long time. Um, and like you said, it's it's not something that goes away. And I and I like I I don't think we would be in this work if we were people that that kind of stuff did kind of fall off us. You know, like, I think the reason that we are in this work is because we feel deeply and we hold on to these. Yeah, I, I, no, absolutely. And, and it's just when you work with clients and just you just never know, you know, their story and it could be something you never heard before. And it just you take you know, it takes you aback and it's like I don't want to say like kind of like traumatizes you in a way, but in a way it kind of does, like, it's just like, wow, like some of the stuff, like, you know, I've seen and I, I've dealt with and they're hearing of you know, people's stories, like other social workers and, 
and what they've gone through and you know, I, I, I met some social workers online and already talking about like retirement, like I can't do this work anymore because of, of you know what they've seen in their work that they do so much and, and it's just you know, clients that they dealt with and that they deal with on, on a day to day basis and it's just a lot for you know we're humans at the end of the day. So it's just a lot to you know take in and it's a point that you somewhere you gotta process all, all, all that stuff. So you know it's definitely uh you know it's a lot. You know we still in a pandemic and it's like you know, there's many of us social workers and school buildings doing field work, going going through the houses and mm-hmm. all this stuff. And it's just working hospitals and so it's just like we are uh, you know risking our lives on, on a day in day out basis and I mean the least the government could do is is forgive our our student loans to to for all the work that we do. But that's that that's not happening. <laughs> I'm still hoping for that one. I'm still hoping for that one. Man, I- now we had, you know, cer- certainly vicarious trauma, all that, right? Yeah, uh, absolutely. That's, fatigue, the word, that's the word I'm looking for. That's, that's the word I was looking for. Secondary trauma response, all that stuff is real, right? And like, what happens is like, when you start to exhibit symptoms of trauma, right? When you are surrounded by trauma, you yourself become, there's no way you can. Um, and there was a quote that, I love around that helps like me wrap my head around vicarious trauma is like um, you can't walk through a storm and not expect to get wet right like uh, so you know there's a reason why nonprofit work you don't people don't work if you are in a nonprofit for three four years right like a you you're one of the more senior folks in the space oftentimes right mm-hmm. maybe i don't know let me let me let me step back and be very, yeah, honest, be very that, clear i mean that's that's some truth this is my depending, depending this where is my experience yeah <laughs> that's, that's, not, that's how not, i managed it that's how i managed it let me step that was back my experience too like when that the clients tell you like you, you still here like you still working here like, <laughs> it's like a, a, year, a year or two like, right 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 <laughs> like everybody right. leaves after like six months and is, that is not by accident. That is not by accident. No, but but that, but that's that's true, especially if in like in New York or I mean my experience mostly been in New York until this last going on like a full year. So definitely like, nonprofits, like the longest job I've had was like eight years. Like I went to grad school and got out of grad school and so and then every every job since I'm like there like a year, two years, maybe two years. So I've done a little as like four months somewhere. So it's not a territory. So it is what it is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, where where can people find you? Um, Q dot Burrow. That's my um. That's my um. My Instagram, that's kind of all I have. I'm not a big social media dude. Um, folks can email me. Um, I don't know. I'll put all that stuff in the, not that, I mean, you know what I mean? Like, I'll put my contact information in the chat. Um, Bernier, LCSW at gmail.com. Um, and that's kind of it, you know, like, uh, yeah, uh, I don't really, I'm not a, I'm not good at this, at that, at that stuff. And I feel like, I got, um, I have, I'm pretty busy, so it feels, it feels good. <laughs> so I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk fast. No, no, absolutely. Thank you so much for, for coming on. I, I, you know, I appreciate you and all the work that, that you're doing. I'll give you your flowers and keep up the great work. And if there's anything I can do from my end, you know, by all means, you know, you know, reach out and let me know. Yeah, let's stay connected. If you're looking for interns, there's oh, you know, there are Columbia students all over uh, the U.S. through their um, uh, through their virtual program. So we, they're place students all over all yeah. over the country. Man, I, I wish there was a virtual option when I when I when I think it might have <laughs> it might might have helped a, a little bit. You no, know, my, my son my son was 
was a baby like my last year. So yes. it was like that's true. That's I'm, true. I'm, I'm, when did you when did you graduate, Bass? I graduated in 20, 2010. Okay. Okay. Officially yeah. October in August twenty ten. I was 2015, but same thing. I had uh, my second my second son during the fall of my first year. So I agree. If there was a remote option, I would have uh, certainly, you know, taken it. But <laughs> but, but, how, but how how was how was that like like for you like you know managing grad school and then like parenting because. It was rough. I think I was just like floating in the air. I was like, like I needed a, like I almost like I needed a vacation from like life. Like it was a full time job, going to school, and then doing an internship. And it's like I need a break. <laughs> it's like there was no break. <laughs> yeah, I did it. I took an extra year. I knew it wasn't going to happen in two, uh, so it was a lot. But I think it helped me realize like how much like I could I can take on a lot <laughs> and I, I, I think I um, I think it helped me it helped show me how much I can handle um, so I'm really grateful to the social work space um, and again like all the options that it, it gives you the opportunity to pick so many different things and remain, true to who you are like you i don't feel like i have to sacrifice like my morals or the things that i truly believe in to do this work and be and be a part of it and feel successful amen to that and on that note thank you so much and we'll talk soon i appreciate you guys yes be well talk soon thank you for the opportunity peace